Hi, Dr. Drew Weissman. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. So my name is, I just, I'll introduce myself. My name is Allison. I currently work as a hospital nurse. Um, and so I'm kind of an advocate for the work and I'm really, really, um, you know, interested in everything that you're doing. And I think that for the purpose of the general public, I would really like to get some questions answered that I know a lot of people have <laughs> in regards to the, um, the work you do. So can you explain a little bit more about what is it you, you did for the, the science and technology behind the uh, vaccine? Sure. So uh, let me start with what mRNA is, because people Perfect. probably don't understand that. Right. Um, our genetic code, you know, what, what makes us, is in our DNA. Th that's what we pass on to our kids. The, our DNA makes every protein in our body. Those proteins make our cells, help them function. Th they, they do everything. So the what RNA is, RNA makes a copy of individual proteins in our DNA and then carries that to a machine that reads the code in the RNA and makes proteins from it. So an RNA from every single protein can make that protein. What we're doing with our vaccine Current vaccines use inactivated viruses like influenza, live viruses that are attenuated like measles, mumps, and rubella. They use subunit proteins. So that means they, they take one protein out of the virus, produce it in a big vat of cells, and add an adjuvant and inject that. All of those methods involve producing either viruses or proteins, uh, which is a, a difficult, expensive, and slow process. Mm -hmm. With mRNA, we're shortcutting. We're delivering the code. And what happens is that the person's cells makes the protein. It reads the RNA and makes the protein. Once it does that, our immune system recognizes that protein and makes an immune response that leads to protection from that pathogen. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really, how, so how long have you guys been working on this um, mRNA technology? So uh, Katie Carrico and I started over 20 years ago. Wow. Um, 2005 is when we figured out how to get rid of the inflammation. So the, the problem with RNA before then was that it made animals sick uh, because it induced a lot of inflammation. Inflammation is like a bacterial infection where you know, people get sick, they, their blood pressure go down, uh, they feel lousy. So th that wouldn't work very well for a therapeutic or a vaccine. Okay. So we figured out how to get rid of that inflammation. And the RNA that we developed doesn't induce any inflammation and it makes a lot more protein. So that's really great. So some of the concerns that I hear from people, and I can understand their concerns because they think it's, it's so new to, to the public, but for you guys, you've been working on this for a while. So some general concerns I think that most people have, they're worried about it possibly affecting fertility. Now, is there any link that you can think of in the future or immediately that that could possibly be infected, uh, affect the people's fertility? So th that hasn't been studied in humans. It, we've studied it in animals and we never see any effect. Uh, so we, we've immunized pregnant uh, animals. We immunized animals and then get them pregnant. There is no, you know, the, 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 the number of, of babies, the, uh, everything is identical. So we have never seen an effect on fertility in animals. It's hard to imagine in people how it would do that. Right. Because you know, the, the RNA doesn't affect DNA. Exactly. It doesn't change your DNA. It doesn't, it doesn't make breaks. It doesn't make mutations. 
it, it does nothing to our DNA. Yeah. We all have to go back to biology and think about like our first couple of chapters when we learned about um, the RNA and all of the different types and DNA. And yeah, I remember it. I get flashbacks now when I <laughs> have to read about it. Um, so another question as I have had, or I've seen around is people are with autoimmune diseases. Would you recommend them getting the vaccine? Can that trigger anything for them? Yeah, so that, that's another unknown. You know, we've never seen an autoimmune disease in any of our animal models. In, in the end, the RNA vaccine is the same as all other vaccines. It causes our immune response, that causes us to make an immune response. So it, it's hard to imagine why the RNA vaccine would be any different than any other vaccine. Mm -hmm. well, one thing that people will sometimes argue is that all vaccines induce activation of the immune system. That's how they work. They turn on the immune system to make a response. Could that activation turn on an autoimmune disease? Well, we haven't really seen that. But, you know, I, I never say it can never happen because I just don't know. Yeah, it, It's just hard to imagine that it would happen. There's always, a, there's always a slim chance, I think, in all of medicine that there's going to be that one in a million chance that something could, that's what I tell all my patients too. I'm like, well, what if it happened? Like, I can't say that it won't, but what, from what we know, you know, it, it probably will be okay. Now I did have a question from, so these are questions from people who are interested in getting the vaccine. They just have a couple of, they're a little bit reserved on something. So the fertility issue was one. Another one was somebody who had um, severe asthma. I wouldn't, in my mind, as a little hospice nurse, I can't think of a connection between this and um, triggering an asthma flare up or somebody having an asthmatic attack just because of a vaccine. But from your um, experience, would you say there could be any link with somebody getting the vaccine who has a history of asthma? So it's, I, I can't imagine how this would happen. Right. There have been a couple of reactions that people, there was a few in England, there's been a few more in the US. What those are, that they were initially described as anaphylaxis. Hmm. And they were in, in people who were hyperallergic who need EpiPens because these sort of things happen. So they had a previous allergy to... Well, no, so what, what those people actually, they, they didn't have anaphylaxis. What they had is called an anaphylactoid reaction. What that means is that it isn't antigen specific. It's not like a peanut allergy uh, or a, a milk allergy. What happens is that in hyperallergic people, their systems are primed when in response to any kind of trauma, any kind of activation can sometimes make a reaction that looks like anaphylaxis, but isn't. That's what they had. Okay. So yeah. they weren't allergic to the vaccine. Okay. So that was just something their body was prepared to do. And that's exactly how it played out because the body was like, I don't know what this is. So I'm going to kind of yep. freak out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now I think a, a generalized, and I know you probably have gotten this question a hundred times, but I think a generalized concept um, going around is they feel that the vaccine is rushed. And I've heard this from a lot of people. And in my mind, I understand the scientific process and that there's already been a lot of work put into what you guys do um, and the technology behind it. But what would you say to people who are feeling a little bit reserved? They feel that it's still so new. Yeah, so you know, the, the, I, I joke, that's one of the things that we can't win. Because yeah. if we had gone slower, people would have complained, what's taking you so long to make a vaccine? The people sword. are dying, yeah. right? Yeah. So you, what I tell people is the technology has been around for 15 years. Right. We and others have been working on this for a lot of years. It isn't a brand new thing. What's new is that it's never been FDA approved before. It's been in clinical trials since 2017. So that means some people have been followed for three years uh, after getting a vaccine and they've all done fine. Wow, that's amazing. 
for, for the clinical trial part of this, what's different is that in the old days when they made a vaccine, you did a phase one trial, you looked at the results, you, you talked about them, you spent a year, then you went to the FDA and said, I wanna do a phase two trial. You do the trial, you talk about it, you look at the results. A year later, you go back to the FDA and say, I wanna do a phase three trial. Um, what happened here is they did all the trials at the same time. The phase one and phase two were done at the same time. The phase three started the minute the phase two ended. So the, 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 the trials themselves were done exactly like every other trial. They were just done on top of each other uh, simultaneously and as fast as they could. Right. And I think what people, a lot of people need to realize is that the urgent need for this vaccine due to the mortality rate and how it is severely contagious versus the flu, this one has such a long incubation period, you can end up spreading it to way more people. My biggest fear or concern, about half of the people who transmit don't have any symptoms. So right. they don't know they're sick. Uh, and, and what do you do about those people? You know, they're sitting there transmitting left and right, and you have no idea that that's happening. Exactly. Well, I had another question. I was looking into your research. So what else is, do you do with RNA technology as far as um, research? Yeah, so we've got a bunch of things. Uh, half of my lab works on vaccines. We've got probably 30 different vaccines for, for 30 different pathogens everything from malaria to genital herpes to Ebola, uh, all sorts of things. Um, we have five clinical trials that we started planning before COVID hit for other diseases. So we are actively moving RNA vaccines uh, for new diseases into people. The other half of my lab works on therapeutics. So th those are things like, you know, the simplest are monoclonal antibodies. It costs $10,000 a dose for a monoclonal antibody treatment because they're hard to grow, they're hard to purify. We think RNA is a much better, safer and faster way to make uh, protein therapeutics. We have a, a bunch of programs looking at versions of gene therapy. Um, one of them is we, we have a program for CAR T cells. So Penn put CAR T cells into people. Uh, two of them have been approved by the FDA. They're fantastic at treating certain types of lymphoma or leukemia. They're being investigated for a bunch of other diseases. The problem is that to make a CAR T cell you have to leukophorese the patient. That means you put them on a machine for a couple of hours and the machine collects white blood cells. You then take those white blood cells, you put them into a cell culture facility that's specially made for treating people and you stimulate the cells for 10 days. Then you infect them with a Lenny virus that delivers the CAR T and then you give them back. That treatment costs $450,000 because it's incredibly complex. It needs you know, specialized laboratories. Um, we've developed a way to deliver CAR T's with a simple IV injection. And we did that, we can now target the LNPs so that we can send the LNPs to T cells or to bone marrow stem cells. So now, you know, once we can target them, we can deliver a CAR T with an IV injection, and then it works, it fights off the cancer, and, and you're done. So instead of $450,000, you're probably talking 50 bucks a treatment or something like that. We've also been, you know, we, we've been able to target bone marrow stem cells. We're using it for sickle cell anemia. Th that's probably the, the, the widest distributed bone marrow uh, genetic defect. 
there is an FDA approved treatment where they take bone marrow out of a patient, grow it, infect it with a Lenny virus and give it back. That's great in the United States or a few places in Europe that have the facilities, but you can't go to sub-Saharan Africa and treat 150 million people that way. So we figured out how to inject an LNP that goes to bone marrow stem cells and corrects the genetic defect that causes sickle cell anemia. So now treatment is a single IV injection. Uh, th that can be expanded to lots of different genetic diseases, lots of different therapies uh, for a lot of different diseases. Amazing. That's incredible. I think that's interesting to find out that not only are we using it for our virus, but since it has been around, you guys have been researching it for long, so long that there's all of these therapies that are up and coming and have helped people already. And I think that's amazing work that you guys are doing over at Penn State. And I know all the nurses and physicians are, are getting a lot of, you know, they're getting, they're getting tired. Um, and I, yeah, that's very understandable and I, I feel for them and I know my friends who work in COVID units and the ICUs are for them the mor the mortality in itself is weighing down um, never mind the daily work that they have to do so we greatly appreciate you um, I can't wait to um, share this with some of them I know they're going to be really excited I just wanted to get a a more simplistic I guess explanation from the man behind the, the work so that people can see that this isn't something that is just rushed, just the need was there and we got it done a little bit quicker because like you said, the waiting process in between wasn't there, yeah. but the clinical trial trials were just the same as they would have been before. Yep, exactly. And was your wife a subject in the clinical trials? Yes, yeah, so both my wife and my younger daughter were in the phase three clinical trials. Wow. See, it's a family effort. It really is. <laughs> but, you, know, I, you know, I tell people I, I was willing to have them uh, be in the clinical trial. Uh, I actually got my vaccine, my first one last week. Um, my, 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 my wife and daughter were unhappy because they had my, my wife's arm hurt for an entire day. She could barely use it. <laughs> my daughter had flu-like symptoms. Uh, I had about an hour of arm pain that I barely noticed and uh, that they, they wanted me to have more. Oh gosh. Did you get it in your dominant arm or your non-dominant arm? I did my non-dominant. Did non-dominant. That's what I do usually. Cause one time I was like, well, if I do it in my dominant, then maybe I can work it out a little more than when I got my flu shot. And I just, I don't tolerate pain well. So I was useless for about like a whole entire day. So I know yeah. now I'm well prepared for it. It's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll live. The pain is a little bit of soreness is totally worth getting the shot. I, I love ed educating is huge on me. That's one of the biggest part of my job is education. And I love just because I, I can, we have to all understand that the general population might not really understand everything that's going on behind the vaccine. So I think it's, it's the best for us to be understanding. And as medical professionals, educate, educate them to the best of our knowledge. And as long as they're open to the conversation, that's all that really matters, <laughs> yep. as long as they're open to hear about it. So thank you. No, of course. Thank you. Have a good one. Stay safe. Stay healthy. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.